Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jules Messier. I'm Jules Messier, and something I love to do on the something I love to do on this channel is to is to go over the history of different technologies of different technologies, whether it be. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and something I absolutely love doing on this channel is going over the evolution of particular technologies, whether that be night vision, mining safety lamps, camera flashes, etc. Today, however, we're going to be going over the evolution of a very particular product. So as you'll recall, a little while ago, I covered this neat gadget. This is a Kodak Carousel Slide Projector Programmer Model 1. This was introduced in the early 1960s and allowed you to automatically synchronize a slideshow with pre-recorded audio. Now, as I mentioned a couple of videos ago, I was recently gifted a steamer trunk full of vintage photographic equipment. And among the many gadgets in that trunk was this, the Kodak Carousel Sound Synchronizer Model 3, a later version of this same technology introduced in the late 1970s. And as you can see, this is considerably more compact than the original. So I want to have a closer look at this and show you exactly what changed in only 10 years. Now, before we get started, I do need to point out that there was a Model 2 Sound Synchronizer, which was introduced in the early 1970s, but the Model 2 and the Model 3 are largely identical, save for a little bit of extra circuitry in the Model 3. So throughout this video, I will basically be talking about the Model 2. Now, if you haven't already seen my video on the Model 1, do yourself a favor and go do that right now, because in common with a lot of Kodak electronic products of this period, the circuitry in here is really cleverly and elegantly designed. But in summary, this allowed you to program trigger tones or trigger beeps onto your narration recording, such that when the recording was played back, those tones would automatically trigger the slides to change. Now, this was designed for use with mono tape with only a single recording track, meaning that it had to generate tones of a particular frequency and incorporate an audio filter to isolate those tones from the rest of the audio. Otherwise, other random noises on the recording could potentially trigger the slide change. The Model 2 and 3, however, were designed for use with stereo tape, with the trigger tones being recorded on one track and the narration on the other. And this had two main advantages. Number one, the distracting trigger tones were now no longer present on the actual narration track. And number two, since you didn't need an audio filter anymore to isolate the trigger tones, the resulting circuitry could be a lot simpler and more compact. And this was made even more compact via the great advances in consumer electronics technology between the 1960s and the 1970s. Whereas the Model 1 used vacuum tube technology, the Model 2 and Model 3 incorporated some of the first commercially available integrated circuits. So let's have a closer look at this and let me show you how this is set up and how it works. So I haven't been able to determine exactly when the Model 2 is introduced, though the earliest mention of it I've been able to find is in a 1972 Kodak product catalog. And this makes sense since the integrated circuit this uses, the Motorola MC914G, was first introduced in the late 1960s. And as you can see from this catalog page, the Model 1 was still being sold for $132.50, while the Model 2, despite being brand new, sold for only $39.90, a third of the price. So this comes in a cardboard box in classic Kodak yellow, and if we open this up, we have a handsome clear plastic clamshell case. So not only is the Model 2 considerably more compact than the Model 1, it is also much simpler. In fact, it has no switches, dials, or other controls at all. Just a 5-pin socket on top for the projector remote control cable, a 5-pin plug that plugs into the remote control socket on the projector, and a quarter-inch audio jack. So to program your slideshow, you would plug the synchronizer into the right channel input on your stereo tape recorder and your microphone into the left channel input. And then you would turn on your projector and your tape recorder. And as you're recording your narration, every time you want the slide to change, you simply hit the slide advance button on the remote. And this will program a trigger tone onto the right channel of tape. Now, the instructions suggest a tone duration of between 70 and 800 milliseconds. So just a very brief tap on the button and a minimum spacing between tones of one to three seconds. You're also not supposed to use the reverse button because while this will generate a trigger tone, it will only cause the slides to advance. 
And you're also not supposed to use the focus control on the remote because this could potentially generate electronic noise that can cause the slide to accidentally advance. You can, however, use the automatic focus or the manual focus on the projector itself. Now, I don't have a functioning stereo reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, but I can connect this up to this little digital recorder using this quarter inch to 3.5 millimeter adapter. And in this way, you can hear what the trigger tone sounds like every time I hit the advance button. Now to play back your program slideshow, you would then plug the synchronizer into the right channel output of the tape recorder and your speakers into the left channel output and then play your recording. Now, unfortunately, I can't do this with this recorder because this equipment requires at least one to three volts in order to successfully trigger a slide change. And this puts out only around 750 millivolts. And also, although I've tried running this signal through a variety of audio amplifiers and doing other things to the signal, I just can't get this thing to work. There must be something wrong with the electronics themselves, or I just haven't been boosting the signal enough. I just don't know. Now, if I manage to actually get this up and running, I will upload a new version of this video with footage of the unit in action. But for now, you're just going to have to take my word for it. My apologies. Now, according to the manual, the sound synchronizer could be used with something called a dissolve control. As the name suggests, this allowed you to smoothly dissolve between two slides rather than abruptly changing. However, this required the use of two separate projectors, with the dissolve control dimming down the lamp on one projector while dimming up the lamp on the other to achieve a dissolve lasting anywhere from instantaneously to five seconds. There was also something called the EC automatic timer, which allowed you to set your slides to sequence at a fixed interval. Now, both of those sound like really neat products. So if I ever come across examples of either, I will definitely feature them on their own videos on the channel. So let's actually now take this apart and let me show you what is inside. To do this, we just remove these three screws in the back. And out comes a remarkably uncluttered circuit board. So this is divided into two main regions for recording and playback. Here we have our circuitry for generating the trigger tones, which as I mentioned before, incorporates one of the first commercially available integrated circuits, the Motorola MC914G. This is a resistor transistor logic circuit or RTL, which is a two input NOR gate using four transistors and seven resistors, which in this case is configured as a sine wave generator. And here we have our playback circuit, which uses this diode to rectify the incoming trigger tone. The resulting DC signal is then fed into this C106 silicon controlled rectifier, or SCR, which allows current to flow into the projector solenoid circuit and trigger the slide change. Now, as you can imagine, the system is not very frequency selective and can be triggered by a wide variety of different signals. And indeed, in the instructions, it says you can use a tone generator or some other means of producing your own custom trigger tones if you so desire, provided the frequency lies between 200 and 2000 hertz. Now, since the fundamental frequency of the adult human voice, male and female, lies around the 200 hertz mark, you could theoretically produce your own trigger tones vocally. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned that there was only a slight difference between the Model 2 synchronizer introduced in the early 1970s and the Model 3 synchronizer introduced in the late 1970s. And that difference was the inclusion of an isolation circuit to prevent the production of ground loops when using grounded projectors and tape recorders, which could generate audio interference and inadvertently trigger a slide chain. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I hope you found that interesting. I certainly found it fascinating to go over the rapid evolution of this particular product, as well as the great paradigm shift in electronics technology that it represents, a shift that occurred over the course of only 10 years. Now, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more mid-century automation technology and other devices just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messi from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.